Good morning, I'm Morgan Donner and today's video is going to show you how to make a simple pair of joined hose. Let's start out with a quick bit of background. Men's hose for most of medieval European history consisted of a separate pair of long socks or hose. Fun fact, that's why we refer to pants today as a pair of pants because they used to be two piece garments. As men's fashion hemlines rose, so too did the hose coverage. In the mid-1400s, we start to see the hose joining in the back to cover up the bum, and also rising to the waist as freestanding, no strings attached, literally, garments. One step closer to pants as we sort of think of them today. Today, I'm going to make some vaguely 16th century joined hose for my mister. It can be hard to pin down an exact decade since hoes of this style were present throughout the 16th century in various forms. So I am a little bit rubbish at drafting pants patterns from scratch, so instead we're going to take a shortcut today and start out with his best fitting pair of pants. Under the pants, I have brown butcher paper to draw my pattern onto, and under that, a layer of cardboard to pin into. Back to the pants, you'll notice that, like most modern pants, there are seams on the inside and the outside of the leg. We need to move that to the back of the leg. So while we're looking at the back of the pant leg, we'll grab the middle and fold the pant leg so that the seam is centered. Well, sort of. Really, I want the two seams resting right on top of each other. So since the back half of the pant contains a little bit more fabric, the seam will actually be slightly to the front. Once flattened, I'll pin the leg clearly to mark the front and back fold. It might take a little bit of work to adjust the fabric of the leg as flat as possible. If you can, you want to try and make the front edge straight, move any curviness that you find to the back of the leg where possible. You might end up with a little bit of excess fabric like I did here at the back of the knee. That's okay, it'll work out. Mark the pattern paper all around the pants. Tossing some pins in along the way through all the way through to the cardboard can kind of help keep everything immobile while you trace. You can't easily trace the waist here though, since the fabric of the other leg is in the way, so using a pin, press through the edge of the waistband several times along the length, making sure to push all the way down through the pattern paper and into the cardboard. It's hard to see here, but there are now little pin marks in the paper that I can use to draw the waist. Just connect the dots. The first half of the leg is done, so I'll flip it over and work on the other half. Match the front fold of your previous marking and trace the second leg, keeping again that front seam nice and straight. Instead of a slightly tricky waistband, now we have the very tricky U-shaped crotch seam. I'll use the same technique though, again I'll mark the paper by pinning through the pants into the cardboard following that seam, until I have a little trail of pin marks to follow. Don't forget to remove all the pins from the original pants. Nobody wants surprise pins in their clothes. I traced over the whole thing with marker to make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. No need to trace the center though, we won't be needing that mark anymore. I'm going to make a few modifications, like making the pants about a hand width higher so that they'll sit on his waist instead of his hips. And I'm adding a little bit of length to the bottom so that these can become stirrup hose. If you would like to know about how to make footed hose, check out my How to Make Medieval Stockings video, which I'll link to below. For now though, just a little band under the feet. I thought about having the seam directly in the middle, under the heel, but I figured it might be a little bit more comfortable for him if the seam were on the side of the foot instead. So far, I've just drawn the seam, now I'm adding the seam allowance. For this project, I'm using a 5 eighths of an inch, but feel free to use your preferred seam width. Once the pattern paper is cut out, I can get some of the cheap mock-up fabric I have lying around to test our new pattern on. I already know that the modern pants were much bigger at the calf and ankle than I'd like, so sewing up a mock-up is an absolute must for this project. This blackish gray fabric I am using is a quilted cotton, no stretch, which is important. I usually get most of my testing fabric like this from a thrift or charity shop since it's far cheaper than shopping at a proper fabric store. The fabric is often slightly stained or damaged, but that doesn't really matter if you're just using it for mock-ups anyway. The two leg pieces are cut out and I'll sew them together at the crotch seam. When that's done, we'll need to sew the back seam of each pant leg. 
be careful here. It might be kind of tempting to just toss these seams together like you see here, but that would be incorrect. I sewed the first seam with light fabric side touching light side, so I should do the same for the leg seam. It will help avoid mistakes if you pick a leg and pin from the ankle up, being careful of course to pin right fabric to right fabric. If you've pinned everything correctly so far, you should have three seams in the back with the seam allowances all coming out on the same side. Sew the pinned seams and while you're at it, go ahead and sew the little stirrup strap under the foot too. The mock-up is assembled and we see here that the front of the waist is a little bit funny. The back curves up like it should, but the front would normally curve down. I won't cut it off just yet, let's see how it looks in the fitting first. Speaking of fitting, he won't be able to try the pants on with the fly area sewn up like this, so with a seam ripper I'll let that seam out about 8 inches down. Now we can try it on. Looks like he has plenty of movement, and the waist to thigh area looks pretty good, so let's work on fitting the calves. I want to tighten the leg by pinning the back seam in, and when I asked him to bring his leg up, we noted that there was a little bit of restricted movement there, so I made a mental note to make the stirrup a little bit longer. To transfer the new seam line, I've marked the sew line where the pins are, and then added the 5 8 seam allowance. Cut the excess fabric off at that new seam allowance, and use the little cutoff to mark the paper pattern. Don't forget to transfer both the cut and the sew line. I'm going to lengthen the stirrup strap by about an inch or so, so I cut the strip open, tossed a bit of scrap paper in to fill the gap, and then added a bunch of tape to both sides to keep everything neat and together. And there we go, we've extended our pattern paper. The fabric that I've chosen for the actual hose is a thin red wool. It should be fairly cool even in the summer. I'm placing the pattern slightly off the straight grain. Don't tell the sewing gods. In all seriousness, this uh, slight shift will result in the more efficient use of fabric, and the hose can only benefit from the slight additional stretch that that off-grain cut will provide. Or maybe it'll completely F everything up. Who knows? I like to pin my pattern paper onto the fabric so that it can't shift around while I'm trying to trace around it with the chalk. Once the first piece is traced, I can unpin it, flip it around, and mark the second leg. Since I technically only rotated the pattern here and didn't actually flip it over to the other side, that means I'm sort of tracing the same leg twice, but fortunately this fabric is the same on both sides and doesn't have a directional pattern like a fancy brocade might, so I can pretty safely get away with this bit of uh, sewing naughtiness. Do be careful to note whether or not your own fabric is directional at all, and if it is, place your pattern accordingly. For funsies, instead of sewing the crotch seam first, I'm going to go ahead and sew the legs first. Why not? Pin your leg pieces together. I started out by pinning the top edge and the bottom edges first, and sort of meeting in the middle. I quickly noted that I had a bit of excess fabric on one side, and decided to handle that by easing the excess in around the derriere area. See how the bottom layer of fabric here is taut and smooth, while the top layer is a little bumpy? I'm going to ease those bumps down, dividing the excess fabric evenly as possible between pins so I don't end up with any accidental pleats. By folding the fabric in my hand and sort of bending it up towards the excess, I can pin the middle evenly fairly easily. Something to note if you are ever easing a larger piece of fabric into a smaller one is that it's usually a good idea to have the larger side towards the bottom of the machine as you sew, so that these little feed dogs here on the sewing machine can pull the fabric as it sews. Once you've sewn the first leg up and you're pinning the second leg, be extra mindful that the leg mirrors the first. You don't want to accidentally create two left legs. Or maybe you do, but personally, I'd rather have one left leg and one right leg. Once the leg seams are sewn, I want to iron the seam open. Doing this tends to let the seam lay nice and flat, and it'll make it easier to sew the seam allowances down later. See how nice the top half of this seam looks compared to the bottom half? When you're ready to join the two legs, lay them out flat so you can verify where all your seams line up, and then we can sew this back seam together. Be careful that you're putting the correct sides of the fabric together. We want all of the seam allowances to be on one side. 
I decided to start from the center back and make my way forward. Instead of sewing the whole crotch seam and then seam ripping open the fly area, I'll toss a few pins in here at an angle to remind myself to stop sewing on the machine once I reach this point. Sorry about the weird light bloom in all of these close-ups of the red fabric. This seems to happen every time I film red fabric. Uh, if you know anything about photography and filming and have some ideas on how I can fix it in the future, please do leave me a comment. Now I'm going to add the waistband facing. I have a strip of linen here already cut out, and one of the great things about linen is that it's fairly strong and will help prevent the waistband area from stretching out over time. I'm just using a straight strip no shaping or anything like you might normally do for a facing. I'll sew that down with the same 5 8 seam allowance that I've done with everything else on this project so far. Then I want to iron the waistband down towards the inside of the hose, and I will also fold over the free edge of the linen band approximately 5 8 of an inch so that I can hand sew that part of the facing down. Ironing a fold of fabric in place before you stitch is kind of nice because it helps hold everything in place without any effort while you're actually doing the sewing. Once the waistband is ironed in place, I also want to work on the facing for the opening of the hose. I'll add another piece of straight grain linen, pinning it in place about half an inch or so down from the top of the hose. That little gap is going to be covered by the waistband, so I might as well not put extra bulk in that area. Sew the fly facing down, and then iron it towards the inside of the hose, just like we did with the waistband. To help further reduce bulk in the area where the two facings meet, I'm going to trim out a little corner here. It might take a little bit of extra ironing and finagling, but eventually you should have a nice and neat corner where the two facings overlap. To sew the folded free edge of the facing, I have a thread that's been doubled over for extra strength, and I'll do a line of whip stitches to secure the facing down. As I do each stitch, I try to only grab a little tiny bite of the fabric from the red wool so that the stitch is as invisible as possible when looking at it on the right side of the fabric. To secure the overlapped facings, I'll use the same stitch, but now I don't even need to go all the way through to the right side of the fabric. I can just sew the two facings to each other. Ta-da! Don't forget to sew the little foot strap at the end of each leg, too. For fun, I tried the leg on my own little foot and realized that I actually forgot to make the strap narrower so it's not completely enveloping the heel of the foot. Most of the medieval images showing this style have a rather narrow stirrup band under the foot, so I'll go ahead and mark out an appropriate or so piece of fabric to cut off, being very conservative with how much I remove since this isn't actually meant for my foot, so basing it off of my own proportions is maybe not the best idea. So just cutting a little bit for now, and we can cut more if we need to later once the actual wearer tries it on. So medieval and renaissance era hose do not use zippers or buttons to close. Typically they'll have laces, and in order to lace, we'll need lacing holes. At the top here, I'm going to put two eyelets on either side, and then I'm going to put an additional pair of eyelets further in to help give a little bit of flexibility on how tightly the waist is tied on any given day. To make an eyelet, you'll need an awl, which is this pointy metal and wood thing I'm holding. If you're feeling clever, you might try some combination of slightly sharpened chopstick or maybe a pen or pencil to do this job, but honestly, I'd recommend just going out and buying an awl. It's a tool that does its simple job very well. Poke a hole into the fabric, gently working it bigger until it's about the size that you would need to lace your cord or ribbon through, and then we'll stitch it open, otherwise the fabric would simply close again. Backing up a little bit, to prep my thread for eyelets, I'll need to thread my needle with four threads, and then I'll run it through a little block of beeswax. The beeswax will help keep these four threads together. If you've ever sewn with multiple threads on your needle, then you'll know how they like to sort of twist and tension differently sometimes as you sew. The beeswax will help fix that. Knot the thread at the end and then bring it up through the back between the facing and the outer layers. That'll make it so that the knot is on the inside of the facing and keeps everything very nice and neat and tidy. Sometimes the hole will close up a little bit as you're working. When it does, just use the awl to widen it back up again. Stitch down through the open hole and then up through the fabric a small distance away from the opening. 
Some people like to make the distance between their stitches here very tiny, almost creating a visually solid layer of thread around the eyelet, but Mistress Morgan does not have time for that, so I like to make approximately 10 or so stitches per eyelet. Less if it's a really thin or loose weave fabric that doesn't need a lot of convincing to stay open. To finish up the eyelet, I will typically bring it down into the fabric and then travel between layers to the area of my next eyelet. That way I can do several eyelets per length of thread and I don't have to cut and tie a new knot for each one. A little bit of time spent watching Netflix later and I have a bunch of finished eyelets. I did the four on each side in the front, like I mentioned earlier, for adjustable waistband length. And I also did some at the center back and at the sides, because some outfits that I've already made include the ability to tie into the waistband of the doublet or the jacket, and I want to keep that functionality if these hose are ever worn with one of those jackets. To neaten up the inside, I'm going to do a modified running stitch to tack down the seam allowances. I've already done a wash test on this fabric, and the edges don't fray much in the laundry, which is one of the really great things about wool. If you're using a fabric that does love to fray though, you should consider folding the edges over and whip stitching them down so that the raw edge is completely encased and protected. But to the modified running stitch, running stitch's greatest strength is speed, but it does have a small weakness when it comes to strength. If I'm using two threads, which is stronger than just one, but even then, if the seam is put under a lot of strain, like maybe <laughs> bending over when wearing pants or a hose, then those threads might break since they have no stretch or give to them. If I add a back stitch every centimeter or two of running stitches, it'll give the overall seam a lot more flexibility and stretch, making it a little bit less likely to snap under stress. For the stirrups, there's a short seam here that needs to be secured down, and the edges of the strap too. Here, I've used a running stitch down the middle of the seam allowance, just like I did with the other seams inside, but I've also added some whip stitching to the edge since this area will be rubbing against his foot and the modern socks underneath. To finish the stirrup edges, you could do a modified running back stitch like I'm showing here, or you could do the whip stitch edge instead by itself, and that would probably actually even be better since you'd get a little bit more stretch now that I think about it. Once we finish up those seams, we're done. I've added some laces to tie the hose, but I think I'll cover those in a different video since this one's already pretty darn long. So these simple hose are complete for my specific person, but if you like, you could add a cod piece to cover up the front here. We kept these on the loose side on purpose, but you could also do a little bit more fitting uh, during the mock-up step if you want a sort of tighter look on the hose. I hope you guys had fun learning about how to make some very simple hose, and even if you don't make a project exactly like this, maybe you picked up a trick or two that will help you on a different project. You guys all have an awesome day!